Good evening, and welcome to tonight's lecture. I'm George Craw. Gee, it's great to see so many of you in person again. It's great to have these lectures back live, and it's great to have you still have so many joining us online also. Uh, I'd uh, like to welcome now uh, Dean Alexander Wolf. He's the dean of the Bascom School of Engineering since 2016, and is also a distinguished professor of computer science and engineering. Under Alex's leadership, the school has grown in all directions. Research funding, impact, dynamic new faculty, and a rapidly increasing enrollment in undergraduate and graduate programs. He also expanded the research and academic programs here in uh, Silicon Valley campus. Please welcome Alex Wolf. Okay. The mask, you still still keep it close. <laughs> Thank you, George. Uh, thanks for those kind words. I, I actually think of my, uh, my job more as, as bringing in and supporting people like our speaker tonight and making sure that they are, uh, they're set up for success and, uh, and then share that with the world. So, um, uh, you know, that is our, that's really our, our mission here in, in Baskin Engineering is to uh, provide the kind of um, Engineering that is making the world a better place. So, uh, I also uh, appreciate that you mentioned our, our work that's going on here in Silicon Valley. We have uh, we have faculty here. We have PhD students here. Uh, we have professional master's programs here, and doing work in games and playable media, natural language processing, and um, human computer interaction. So. Uh, it's a it's a really it's really wonderful to be able to be be here. Uh, this is really part of our our campus, of our university, and uh, it's a pleasure to be right in the heart of Silicon Valley, in Santa Clara. So uh, this is a special year for uh, for UC Santa Cruz. Uh, we're marking the 25th anniversary of the Baskin School of Engineering. Um, the school uh, had some uh, early early parts of it um, back to the beginnings, the very beginnings of the university, but it became a, uh, an official school with a, a naming gift in 1997, and so we're celebrating its 25th anniversary. Um, we're, uh, we're celebrating this anniversary by both looking back at some of the, the wonderful achievements that have been performed by our faculty and students and, and research staff. Uh, it's uh, a place where things like the first assembly of the human genome occurred and was published. Um, and I'll recognize David Hausler, who's here, and, and he led that effort. Um, and even the creation of uh, some really spectacular sequencing technology, which has uh, really set the stage for some of the most important work that's been going on in the last, in the last five years, even, um, and was an important part of, of Karen's work as well, as you'll hear. Um, so I'm, I'm really incredibly proud of, of that, what we've been able to achieve. I also want to recognize that today is International Women's Day. And uh, I suppose it was a coincidence that we're having Karen speak here, but uh, it's, it's also um, you know, fitting in, in, in a sense, right? So we were not conscious of that, but here we have one of our, our spectacular junior faculty coming and sharing with you the work that she's already accomplished in such a short amount of time in her, uh, in her career. Um, okay, so. Enough from me. Uh, before we hear from Karen, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our chancellor, Chancellor Cindy LaRive. Uh, Cindy is a first generation college graduate um, and a common thread throughout her career has been a commitment to student success, equity, and inclusion. At UC Santa Cruz, uh, Chancellor LaRive has prioritized improving retention and graduation rates, eliminating equity gaps uh, for students from groups traditionally and historically underrepresented in higher education. And of course, this is a particular challenge for engineering. And uh, with Cindy's leadership, we've really been able to, to put in place some programs that I think are gonna have some, some material impact 
on uh, students' lives and students who have not historically been a part of the story. Um, Chancellor Reeve is an accomplished bioanalytical chemist. Uh, he's written extensively on active and experiential learning, another thing very, very important to Baskin Engineering. Um, and uh, various mentoring activities. She has encouraged the participation and success of women and other underrepresented groups in STEM in particular and has received campus and national awards for her teaching, research, and leadership. So please join me in welcoming Chancellor Cindy LaReef. Thank you, Dean Wolf, and let me welcome everybody uh, who's here with us in person in Silicon Valley today, but also all of you who might be watching on Zoom for the webinar. So it's great to have, um, have our community join us for this extraordinary lecture. You know, the research being done uh, in Baskin Engineering is incredible. It has such a global impact, and equally important is the positive effect that Baskin degrees are having on the lives of our students at UC Santa Cruz. We're proud that we regularly rank as a leading campus for social mobility, taking students from low-income families and putting them on a tra trajectory that uh, through their work after they leave the university, they change the course of their, their lives and their families. And Baskin engineers are really an important part of that. Such a, a large percentage of the undergraduates who leave Baskin engineering enter immediately into the workforce. We hope that that will be true this year too. And, uh, and so uh, if any of you are looking for students, um, we've got some really great ones at UC Santa Cruz. In only 25 years time, Baskin engineering has become an extraordinary asset to our campus. And they are important for our students, but also uh, to our faculty and staff as well. You know, much of research is interdisciplinary in its nature. So uh, our, our faculty and staff and students doing research in the Baskin School of Engineering often collaborate across our campus and around the world. And um, we're lucky at George to have you as, as an alumnus and are honored to have you and your wife, Rafe, here tonight supporting the Craw Lecturers. They make such an impact. Um, the series was born out of uh, George and Rafe's belief that our campus has so much incredible cutting edge research and scholarship worth highlighting and I couldn't agree to more. Uh, tonight's lecture with Dr. Karen Miga is a perfect example. You're in for quite a talk. Dr. Miga is an Associate Director for Human Pangenomics at UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute. She's an Assistant Professor in the Biomolecular Engineering Department in our Baskin School of Engineering. She co-founded the Telomer to Telomer Consor Consortium. For those of you who don't speak genetic uh, code. It's like one end of the DNA to the other, but you'll learn more about all of that from Karen. This uh, Telomer to Telomer Consortium is known as T2T. Uh, she and three colleagues led this international team of scientists to complete the first gapless sequence of the human genome. This is an incredible achievement, and parts of the genome had never been seen before and are now available to study. This gives researchers around the world new insights into the origins of diseases and ways we can potentially treat them. It offers the most complete look ever at the genetic script that underlies the very nature of who we are as human beings and potentially unlocks the secrets of diversity and evolution. For all of this, she was named one of 2022's most influential people by Time Magazine. Dr. Miga directs the Human Pangenome Project. This project aims to broaden the human reference to represent hundreds of diverse genomes from around the world and will serve as a foundation for more inclusive and equitable healthcare. 
She's a recognized leader in genomics and chromosome biology, and her pioneering work with the T2T and Pan Genome Project aims to write the final chapter of the Human Genome Project. It's an honor to introduce you, Dr. Miga. Well, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Cindy, and, and thank you for introducing what a strong and vibrant division we have with the Baskin Science and Engineering, and thank you so much for organizing this lecture. I'm sad that I missed the first one, but I'm so happy there's so many people here and as well that are joining us virtually who can make it today. As mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz. I'm in the biomolecular engineering department, and I have a passion for human genomes. And today I just want to share with you kind of what the exciting science that's happening at Santa Cruz. And I, I think this is a really wonderful opportunity, this particular lecture, because I get to project what people don't know that's coming on the horizon um, that I think is super exciting. And I was thinking when I was designing this talk, where should I start? And I thought what I think everyone in this room needs to understand is how fundamentally important it was to have the first human reference genome. Now, I'm sure you're looking at me and thinking, she's way too young to be part of that, and you're right. But I <laughs> want to emphasize that these individuals worked very hard. <laughs> no, but I want to emphasize that this has been an absolute foundation to how we think about genetics and genomics. And I think everyone who turned on their TV or checked the news when it was announced celebrated what an impactful book of life, understanding our blueprint, all of these buzzwords, how important it was. But I don't think people fully understood what it was. And I think when you start to look at your maps, maybe when you're going home, I want you to think about the book of life, this genome project, as being an equivalent to Google Maps, because this is how we treat it in the genome sciences. Anyone who can open a computer and get on the internet because we have made this open access can have access to this blueprint of life. And this has had ripples through international communities questions now about basic science, how the genome works, where are our genes, what actually makes a cell a cell, how does it develop into an embryo, these are questions we can ask because we can see this map. What variants are important for clinical discoveries? That's something that has just incredibly had growth in our field over the last two decades. And human histories. I think that's something that, as Cindy mentioned, understanding human histories, human evolution, and, and really digging into these variants that tell us about the nature of who we are is something that we've been able to see now that we have this map. I think that it's revolutionized the way we approach disease. And that's something I get asked instantly, like, okay, great, we have this map. Is it mainly for basic science? And the answer is absolutely not. We've had an amazing renaissance in terms of identifying and classifying a number of disease genes. This includes things like oncogenes, as I'm showing you here, for the epidural growth factor receptor, which we know plays a predominant role in things like lung cancer and various other cancers. And it's not only just finding these genetic elements that are involved in disease. Now that we have this map, we can use that information to design new ways to diagnose and treat and find new genetic markers that we could not do before and not at a scale that we can now. And it really is trying to meet the goal of development to personalized medicine that we now can take that bold step forward. And we're starting to see many of us who have friends perhaps that even have cancer that are getting treatment now because of the work that was done 20 years ago to release the first map. Now this has an economic uh, feedback too to society that I think as a scientist we don't really hear enough of, but this has been credited as being perhaps the single most influential investment that has been made in modern science, and hear me out. Um, essentially, back in 2010, I'm going to emphasize this date, we're talking about an economic impact of close to $796 billion and 3.8 million jobs that were either directly or indirectly come from the Human Genome Project. And the return of investment of what we're typically talking about is one federal dollar for every 141, or, sorry, uh, <laughs> generating the, uh, the inverse of that. <laughs> for every one dollar of federal money, we made 141. That would be the opposite way, would not be nearly as exciting for this audience, I promise. 
But uh, that's what I wanted to point to, that these data are actually from 2010. So this is quite a bit of a while ago, and we are only seeing more growth, more expansion, and more benefit from having access to this as we start to move forward with more and more genomic technologies. So here's my point. I'm standing before you today. We all are nodding. We acknowledge that the Human Genome Project was super important. But I want you to know that there's room for improvement, big improvement, and that this big improvement is going to have an increase to benefit to the public. It's going to have an increase in benefit to health. It's going to have an increase of benefit of economic growth again. And it's going to have an increase of benefit, hopefully, if we do this right, around the globe. And so this is something that I'm very excited about because we need to start thinking about what was missing from the first human reference genome. Why was it complete? Why is there room for increased benefit? And the first thing that I want to introduce to you is that something that all scientists, I have to say, is kind of a secret we all knew, um, but many in the public did not, was that the human reference genome, when it was celebrated even in 2003 as being complete, was actually incomplete. And it was incomplete by a measure of around 10 to 8 percent. And when you start thinking about that, that's about 200 million bases. And we knew where these gaps were, and I'm trying to show this on my cartoon here, where we had placeholders. If you were to zoom in on this Google map, it would be just a series of N, 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 kind of like holding it. And this actually took gaps that took up entire chromosome short arms. Many of us are familiar with seeing chromosomes. Centromere regions, as well as places that we knew there were genes embedded within each chromosome arm. If we think about just the amount of bases that we're missing, and we keep that idea that I've started off this whole conversation about this is like Google Map. You can think about this as like when you're looking at Google Map and you zoom in to those blackout zones and you're like, something funny is happening here. If we think about it that way with our genetic maps, when we just do the same type of back calculation of about you know, 8 to 10 percent, we're talking about blacking out an area that would be the size of the continent of Africa. This is a big amount of our map that has been missing for many, many years. And so the reason I'm standing here and the reason I'm getting such wonderful um, introductions is because I was able to co-found a consortium during a pandemic called the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. And what we're celebrating is the release of the first complete human genome. And this is the cover that we had in science, and I love showing it not only because um, it's a really cool looking graphic, but what I want you to see are those red blotches. And what we're trying to illustrate there is those are all the gaps that were filled in with new information. That we can begin to do all those points that I introduced at the beginning of my talk, looking for new um, genetic variants associated with disease, look for new genetic markers, look for new treatments. And this resolution of how we reached it was actually a celebration not only of the people who I have in this wonderful picture, noting that Cindy's part of our group here celebrating in Santa Cruz, and we finally could meet all face to face, but it's also a celebration of technology. And I think that was a lovely an introduction by Alex, saying, you know, it really is some of these sequencing technologies that have just had a momentum that we were able to really benefit from and pull it off. And the idea behind why these sequencing technologies were so useful is really intuitive. Everyone here has put together a puzzle, and we all know putting together a 5,000-piece puzzle is a lot harder than putting together a 500-piece puzzle. And that's the difference from working at the beginning, when you had very short reads or very short sequences and you had to put them together, versus what we're dealing with now. With now, you may have read, 100 base pairs in the past. Now we can reach a million bases. So we are absolutely benefiting from this type of momentum and technology. But what happened is it enabled new science. Now I'm standing before you. I'm not the person who spent my whole career trying to figure out how to put puzzles together. I'm a person who spent my whole career trying to understand about the biology that's been missing in these regions. The, the dark matter of the universe. I want to know what it's actually doing. Um, in this case, I had an idea based on tons of literature of the nature of the sequences in these regions. And it's known that many of these gaps that we just kind of glossed over and said they're ends before have real biological function. And in fact, if you were to remove these gaps, the cell would not work. It's that critical to, to the existence and viability of the cell. We know that these gaps from labeling here as duplicated gene families, what I want you to understand is what I'm showing in this picture, is that a lot of these sites are actually involved with chromosome instability and disease. We know with this area that's the primary constriction of the chromosome known as a centromere, that's fundamental 
to ensure every single time our cells divide, and our cells divide a lot, that our genome is partitioned equally. If something happens in that spot, then the chromosomes don't divide equally, and you have things that can lead to cancer, and you have cell death. And that entire short arm that's missing, well, that has a fundamental reason. That's ribosomal DNA. This is kind of the, the RNA that's important for making all the proteins in your cell. This is critical for life. But I want to also emphasize that it's not only these known things about biology, there's a lot of unknowns once again. It's that enthusiasm we had with the first release of the Human Genome Project, where now we have 200 million bases that have new opportunities to find function, new opportunities for disease biology detection and, for, and future personalized medicine. So I'm excited, as you can probably tell, that these new complete assemblies, having a complete view of the genome, is really important. I think it's going to have real momentum for healthcare. I think it's also going to help us understand genome diversity, not only for human, but moving into comparative genomics, where we have a thriving community now of T to T members for every biomedical genome you can imagine, from non human primates to ruminants to rodents to even xenopus. We have a new cell biology trying to understand comprehensive maps to not only look at the sequence, but how the proteins are actually engaging with this new sequence, too. But I'm going to pivot a bit because I've just led you to think I have the greatest thing in the world and it's done and we should celebrate it. But now I want you to know that just one genome is not enough. And if I were to study the history or the ancestry of this CHM13 genome, this T to T genome, I would tell you it's of European ancestry. And just having one genome is not enough. We've studied for years small differences that exists between our genomes, but I'm here to tell you that there are big differences. And we have not been able to measure these big differences that exist between everyone in this room simply because we didn't have the correct maps. And I'm trying to illustrate this here just to give you a feel of what I'm talking about. So you can imagine on the top is someone in this room's genome, and they have a large insertion. I'm just giving you kind of our, our jargon here, but about 6,000 bases, right? And it's not present in the reference genome. So there's no way to really map it, study it, characterize it, build therapies for it, all the things we celebrated. And we know that there are tens of megabases of these types of sequences, big sequences that have information that's useful that's just missing. And we un also understand that the reference genome, by only using one, introduces a lot of biases in this work. We also know, as I introduced, that one genome's not enough that representation in human genetics and genomics is flawed right now. What I'm trying to show you here is just a really easy to understand how many global population back in 2019, this was census. And then if we start thinking about genetic tests to try to find this disease association, this is just showing you that there's this massive uptake and the number of tests to find disease association. Everyone here should be comfortable with that type of data. What I want to show you is when you break it down based on global populations. And although we have kind of an estimate of global populations, as I'm showing you here, when you actually look at the genetic test and disease association studies, it is abysmal in terms of its true representation around the globe. What we're finding is a lot of the information that we're actively collecting come from only a single population or largely from a single population group of Europeans. And I want to emphasize that a lot of the regions that we were talking about earlier on, these new T to T regions, actually are some of the most dynamic, highly evolving regions in the genome. And so we know these parts, these centromeres, this primary construction, a constriction that's so important for how cells divide, that varies a lot sometimes by millions of bases, by people, in, once again, in this room or listening virtually, there's a lot of variation here, and we don't know what it means. We don't know if it means if you have half a million bases or 10 million bases at this site, and if they're rearranged, if that makes a stronger or weaker allele. We also know that there are different numbers of gene families. Everyone thinks about genes and proteins. This is something we learned in intro bio, but there's actually certain genes in our genomes where there's like four to six to 10 copies. And what does it mean if you have 10 copies versus one copy? And we know that kind of short arm that I introduced that was completely missing before, that that has some pretty incredible evolution that hasn't been studied at this depth and at this resolution. And what we're starting to find is there's a lot of interesting swapping that's going on, and there are a thousand genes that we're kind of characterizing here 
in these short arms that could be affected by this. So what's the end target here? I think that it's not only generating one T to T genome, uh, T to T consortium, pat ourselves on the back, but to break down the wall of that technological barrier and make this to everyone in the room, anyone listening, any health clinic, any biobank, we need to make this standard. And we're starting off with a, a real ambitious goal, and that's how do we recreate this fabric of human genetics and genomics? How do we take that existing human reference genome where we've already seen such tremendous benefit and growth and replace it? with something that's more posed to have equitable healthcare outcomes, more benefit, more opportunities for us to find variants that are meaningful for the clinical community. And the way that we're doing that is the T2T Consortium has formerly partnered with the Human Pan Genome, which makes my life easy because co-founding one and directing the other, <laughs> it's kind of like we brought the family together. And so this has been a wonderful opportunity for our team to really try to bring technology and build a better reference resource. And so what we're talking about is a call to action, this is from NIH, to say how can we introduce this new level of genomic and global genomic diversity. And so the goal here, as was mentioned, is to actually up the numbers here. We're not talking about one genome anymore. We're talking about collecting genomes from at least 350 diverse individuals. And I'm trying to illustrate this here with the straight lines, saying that each one of these I want you to think about as being their own kind of Google map, their own human reference genome. And we've got to be creative. I know there's some individuals in the audience who are CS majors or have uh, a lot of computational background, but the idea of, of having this type of new data structure is something that we have a lot of energy behind building new tools, new ways to study sequences. But I want everyone to <laughs> not get caught up with the data structure. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is very simple. It's taking all of the information from a panel of genomes and presenting that to the community so that you can utilize all of that information. And how we develop tools to make it accessible is just that type of application to ensure that anyone who opens their laptop can gain access to the tools and operate with it. We've already started working on this project. We're in year four. We're approaching 200 genomes. What I'm showing you here is the first 30 that were selected by our population sampling and representation team. These individuals are from several different global recruitment sites that originally were partnered with 1,000 genomes. And we're utilizing these particular cell lines because they match our expectation for having a cell line available for researchers at biobanks, as well as having open consent to ensure that they can be shared and freely available around the world. And I want to emphasize this as big science at its best. I'm really pleased with how much wonderful um, opportunities there are for our team to really nucleate towards a goal, but we're spread out around the U.S. with a number of big production centers that are always tackling technology. And I always, especially for this particular lecture, want to really put a flag down, as I'm showing here, for the UCSC Genomics Institute, because this has been really the site of the reference production center. This is the place where we make things happen in terms of trying to get the most optimized, the most amazing reference genomes that will be critical for the success of this project. And we could not do this. This is not business as normal. This is not an academic base. We could not do this without strong company partners. And so this has been also a wonderful part of being part of UC Santa Cruz, is that we have this type of cross partners with sequencing companies, with data technology companies, with cloud-based companies, and it really has taken this kind of strength of experts to bring it all together. I brought my research program to UC Santa Cruz because I know as well as hopefully everyone in this room and people in how much we've had a big footprint on the forefront of genomics. This is not our first rodeo, so to speak. We were the campus that announced the human <laughs> reference genome back in 1985. As introduced early on, I really want to credit David Hauser and Jim Kent as their role of assembling and making a, a genome browser and ensuring that that second slide that I had up said open access was absolutely the truth. In 2022, it was my great pleasure to have the first meeting. We ordered pizza and we organized the T to T in E2, you know, so it was on our campus. I wish I had taken a picture. I think it would be so much better, but I do like our T to T. Um, and of course, the human pan genome, this is just another 
strong step forward for the UCSD campus, where we're once again redefining the frontier of genomics. And so it's a really exciting time. And it's exciting for time for me to give this particular talk, because we're celebrating the first release of a human pan genome. So this is our first kind of opportunity to say to the public, we've taken you know, 94 high quality phased genomes and we put them together for you. And what we're trying to show you are all kinds of new things that you can find. What I was showing before in my graphic that some people might have that giant yellow 6,000 base pair plot, what I'm trying to show you in this is that we're finding new variation that wasn't there before. And this variation is really important because people in, in the audience, they have tons and tons of clinical data, they have tons and tons of questions, and what we have to do, we're responsible to do, is not only provide this type of reference resource, but all the tooling to ensure that you can take your existing short read data sets and all of your information and bring it into this new reference and make sense of it. Start making new discoveries. So part of this paper is not only a release of the reference, but also demonstrating that you can use this with our standard tools in genetics and genomics to make new calls on these new variants? Can we start to find areas that are being regulated by proteins in a new way? And this is a really exciting thing. I thought for this audience it might be really important to not go on that kind of thousand foot view of counting uh, beans, so to speak, of how many variants we have and how we can map to them, but rather kind of dive in because we've been missing for so long incredibly important variants that we know are important but have been missing from our reference genomes. One in particular is the SMN1 gene. Um, we know, for example, that spinal muscular atrophy is something that we see one in 50 carriers. It's one of the leading cause of early infant death. Um, when children, babies are born, they have little or no motor strength. But we haven't been really able to bring this into the clinic because it's very difficult to study these complex regions with the reference and the tools that we have now. These two genes, we know where they live. They're on our chromosome 5. Um, they're very similar to one another, so there's a lot of swapping that goes on. So this is a very complex area of the genome. But now with our pan-genomic tools and with our assembly, what I'm trying to show you is that we can begin to open up this rich landscape. And what I'm showing you here is kind of a visual way for you to see this area, but I'm actually doing it through a three-generational pedigree. So as I was mentioning, there's one in 50 carriers, but we can begin to study the passage of this entire locus now and begin to study not only in the individual, but in their parents as well. So at the end of my talk, I wanted to use this platform to once again pivot and say, we've come so far, but this is just the beginning. There's lots of reasons to be super enthusiastic about where we're gonna be even in the next five years. We are standing right now at the forefront of long read sequencing and genome technology. UC Santa Cruz and the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium and our production centers are constantly testing these long reads with the goal of how can we make this new reference genome world a reality. It's not right now, but it will be. And I think it's gonna be very exciting to be on that whole process and see the amazing science that's gonna come out of it. As introduced, UC Santa Cruz was always kind of on the forefront. Um, in particular, nanopore technology is something that is very special to our school, really crediting Dave Deemer, who is a colleague of mine in the BME department. This is from his notebook when he was kind of drawing these ideas of you can read DNA through a, a pore. Cells love pores. This is a particular pore that allows DNA to go through. And as DNA passes through, you can actually read a signal file, as I'm trying to show you here, and make base predictions. And our entire campus has embraced this technology, and we've become leaders in nanopore technology and recognized for this type of long read technology. And here I'm just trying to give a shout out to all of the people in my department who are doing amazing work to try to drive this into the future. I also want to emphasize not only the technology component where we, I hope, will reach this more complete reference world, but how UC Santa Cruz is becoming more of a, of a university, at least with the pan-genome work, to engage in international outreach. What we're doing with the pan-genome is moving away from that first map where we were focused only on the shape of the United States. 
and rather starting to build a federated an alliance with global genomic partners. This was with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or GA4GH. And the Human Pan Genome Reference Consortium is really jump-starting this new pan genome global effort. And in doing so, we're helping to define these technical standards with our global partners to ensure quality, open sharing, once again creating the new fabric of the next wave of human genetics and genomics. In doing so, we have an obligation to maintain ethical policy standards, acquisition, sharing, all of the things that are critically important to ensure this is success. And throughout it all, we have to keep in front of mind this idea that we're responsible for resource sharing, and that means outreach and training of undergraduate grads in our next generation of genome sciences. We're pleased that we've already started this process. We've started engaging with international partners now. We're already kind of embedded within GA4GH and trying to find our next phase, where I think you'll hear a lot more, hopefully, if in a future curl lecture when this becomes a little bit more visible to people in this community about how big and exciting this project is. A lot of the work that we're doing is positioned at the crossroads of genetics and society, and it demands careful policy, ethical oversight to ensure that we have proper community engagement and respect. And so this team of, of experts in sequencing technology has the strength because we're partnered with a strong ALSI, or Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications team for consent and outreach. And I can only envision that this type of bridge between social justice and research with genome technology will be a strength that will be permeated on our own campus. There's a quote for the Genomics Institute, which I, when I first met David, I thought was wonderful, and that's genomics for everyone. And that has to be part of this next mission, so I wanted to end my talk with this slide. This was something that um, I was quoted because I, I feel it's absolutely correct that we need to ensure the ability to read our genome as a common global technology and access to genome data and the promise of genome medicine is a fundamental human right. And so what we're trying to do now is explore what that means in terms of partnerships. Explore what that means in terms of building capacity, building T2T -T genomes, building pangenomic outreach outside of the United States. And I think that that's going to be a really exciting era for the next five years. So thank you all for your attention. Um, I <laughs> would never be able to give a talk without this amazing team of scientists who I have the pleasure of working for along the top is really crediting uh, UC Santa Cruz and all of the connections that we have in the United States on the bottom. I really want to emphasize once again all of our strengths and company partners that really make this um, cutting edge. And I did start my lab in August 2021, and it, I would not be as happy and smiling if I didn't have an opportunity to go to work with these amazing people. So I also want to credit my lab. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Karen. Let's go have a chat. Okay. I turn the Come over here. Thank you. So I have some questions um, that I would <laughs> like to ask you, and I'm sure the audience would also like to ask you some questions. So we'll, we'll uh, intermingle them. Uh, we have a, a special way for the questions um, for the folks on <laughs> Zoom to, to ask their questions and have their questions answered that will be outside of this room, unfortunately, but, um, but the questions will get answered. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction to the work. It's obviously just scratching the surface. There's a tremendous amount of, of science and engineering and thought uh, um, that goes into, goes into all of it. Um, we can't expect you to present all of that in, in 30 <laughs> minutes, but um, I'll ask some questions that I, that I hope will begin to get a little bit deeper. Um, one of the things that I, I I was curious about was uh, the discussion of variation and how the genome is evolving mm -hmm. and it evolves rapidly in mm -hmm. certain in certain areas um, versus the notion of having a reference genome, which consists of you, well consists the, the dream is to have three hundred and fifty at this point, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to reconcile the fact that there are three billion people on on Earth or. I think that's what it is, um, 
uh, versus 350 as a reference when there is so much variety, when there is an evolution of the, the genome that is going on. How does that, how does, how do you reconcile that? I love this question because I definitely did not include it in my talk. I think that there's something that our team is focused on and that's common variation. So when you think about things that the base changes in our genome and you're asking, well, how frequently do we see this A to T base change? You know, so we're looking for things that are frequent in the human population. You can imagine there's a next step, which is looking at rare variants, and we're not there. So what we're trying to capture is really this old, common variation that's shared across um, many across the globe. And so I think that has really shaped our numbers. What we've done as a consortium is we've taken this thousand genomes, which is a consortium before ours, who looked at these small nucleotide variants, and they took that frequency measurement. So we have kind of a control set of common variation. And then we said, okay, we've selected now 200 genomes. How well are we representing this common variation? And the answer is really well. We're covering 99% of these small common variants. But we're now taxed with the next part of your question is, what about these new parts, these highly dynamic parts? Are we really covering common variation in that space? And so that's where our team is trying to build the best references possible and really assess that and we have new methods to go out and do exactly which is intuitive. Check and see if we can sample outside, you know, work with Nomad, work with these variant databases. How well are we performing in common variant space? And once we hit that measure, maybe it makes sense to go even deeper and try to get more and more into these rare variants. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, somewhat, I don't know if it's related exactly, but I, I love the, the, um, cartoon that you used of Google Map mm -hmm. and uh, relating it to, uh, relating the, our, our, our blind spot, mm -hmm. essentially, to a hole in the map, and that that hole was equivalent to about the size of Africa, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that, that's very meaningful and, and very mm -hmm. helpful. But I think there's also, my understanding is a sense that Africa actually is a hole in our understanding of, of human disease and of, of mm -hmm. the human genome, and it's for um, a rather more social and political reasons, perhaps, than, than anything else. I mean, there may be a sort of economic reason, but also social and political. Hmm. Are you, so how, how, do, how, are you, how is your group addressing, addressing that? I, just yeah. to expand that a little bit, my understanding <laughs> is that um, you know, there's a fear in particular among uh, people in Africa mm -hmm. of colonization mm -hmm. and exploitation, and that a fear that if they share their genome, that it will be exploited in a way that uh, other resources and other, 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 and other human bodies had been exploited in the past. Yes. Um, how, does, how does your group think about that challenge? That is an incredibly impactful question. I think that our group launched during a pandemic, and so all of the data that we've been working with so far has been using existing cell lines from a prior consortium, utilizing individuals from Africa who had already been recruited in. And I think that your question really moves that importance of what's next and how are you going to really move into areas that we know are, offer so much information in terms of new variants, new information for genome technologies, and can really start to be where we, we should be, thinking about benefit on a global scale and not just what benefits us in our, in our own country. Um, so yes, we're thinking about this. Yes, we're talking about this. Um, I have to admit that because we're in the first phase, we're not a global project. Other than 1,000 genomes, we have not moved into that space, but we have a lot of healthy partnerships with previous researchers that were involved with H3 Africa. We're actively discussing how to broaden our reference resources in collaboration with researchers in Africa, and even exploring with company partners, how can we actually generate data outside of the United States, on site, in country? And how can we start thinking about this in terms of building capacity um, and building a workforce? And I think to me, if we can pull anything like that off, it would be extremely meaningful that 
would not only create an opportunity for us to see the data, but to involve a new workforce that can make use of it and can benefit from it. And I think that this genomics for everyone is a smart tagline, but I also think we always have to have front of mind who's benefiting from having this pan genome and how can we do everything in our power to try to make that. It's never going to be perfect. It's a really tough problem. But I think as long as that's always kind of on our radar is something that's incredibly important for our team to move toward, we'll be on the right path. Yeah, great. Um, I invite questions from the audience, so please. Please, so wait, wait for the mic, please. Thank you for that very, wait, very one, wait a talk. I really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, you know, I was reading a book by E. O. White when, recently, and he said that the largest amount of genetic variation in humans is in Africa, mm -hmm. according to him. Have you got a, a sense of, uh, you know, as you build a genomic, I mean, a, a reference genome, have you got a sense of where a lot of the variation lies and whether for our own well-being, you know, we need the diversity at some point. Is there something different than just picking so many from, you know, South Asia and so many from Europe and so forth versus where the, the diversity lies? And that is an excellent question. Um, absolutely, our, the cradle of humanity is Africa. That presents um, the most variation and diversity, and we should celebrate that we're all one giant human species. And the idea that a lot of the variation we're seeing is just this migration pattern out. I think a colleague of mine made a wonderful example of having a jelly bean jar of all the variation and you're just taking a handful. Or it's the sampling that we're seeing um, going out. So there's a huge, um, I think, benefit for building pangenomics in Africa. And I want to credit a lot of the work that my colleagues in Africa are doing to try to address that call where there are pangenomic projects now in Africa, and we try our best to, to generate as much alignment and partnerships as possible to expand. I think there's another opportunity here too, and it's not strictly on the scientific variant, as you're correctly pointing out, um, if that was the case, perhaps we should focus to where we can get as much sequence information as possible. But there's a, an effort here to create a global community of outreach, training, using, you know, and it's not about this exercise necessarily of understanding human histories, but it's this who benefits to where if you had a globe, for example, and you were to drop a pin on the map, anyone who walks into that doctor's office gets benefit from using this reference genome. And we have to iterate until we have a reference genome that meets that demand. And I think it might be that if you think about this as kind of going out in your evolution of who's your great, 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 you know, so many steps back, that you have some what we call haplotype representation in the pan genome that makes technology and new genetic um, studies relevant to you and your family from here until, I guess, your children's children. <laughs> so, yes. Thank you. Uh, when will individuals like me be able to have our genome studied, and my genome was probably not the same as when I was born. It, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe it evolved because of, of, of age, and maybe it's epigenetics that changed it. I love this question. I think that there's this kind of fantasy, well, we don't think it's fantasy, but the T2T consortium would love for everyone in this audience to have their own personal T2T genome. I think that there is a thought process here of maybe you don't need this giant pan genome reference, but I want to remind everyone in the room about that Google coordinate-based system. No one here would use this Google-based coordinate system if it didn't have rich annotation. If you couldn't plug in, I want to go from here to there, and it told you all the best restaurants and the best things. And so that's critical and that's often overlooked. And so if you can create a reference structure that not only offers kind of a, a sanctuary of discovering new variants and, and that type of information, but also tells you prior information about epigenetic information, frequency-based information, kind of creates that knowledge base, right? That instantly, if you were to have your own genome, you come into this pan genome, you're leaving enriched with more information than you started with. And I think that there's kind of a path to that that's really exciting that we haven't fully explored, but that's something that I think um, is, is part of this pan genome that can't be covered in a very short talk, but I think it's important for people to think about it as being the site of really enriched information. And I do think you're right that one day 
you will have your own genome. I also want to mention, um, to your point, that yes, we are not just one genome. We are a collection of genomes, and our genomes get damaged as we age. And um, with this type of work to understand somatic variation, there's a lot of interest. There's a call to action from NIH for this as well. And we're so lucky our coordination center at WashU is actually the coordination center for the somatic variation consortium. It's also the coordination center for the variant to function um, consortium, which I participate in as well. So it's really bridging into these other scientists that care deeply about epigenetic and functional elements, as well as what we call somatic, or events that can happen in the soma or in the body as you age. And we really want to bring that information into the context of the pan genome to once again strengthen the utility of the resource. Well, as a dean of engineering, I'm I'm obliged to take us down a little bit of a track mm -hmm. towards the technology. Okay. <laughs> uh, so first, let me ask you a very naive question, which is, mm -hmm. um, you know, we know that that people have been having their genome sequenced, kind of. Some, it's become s slightly regular. I mm -hmm. mean that you go into a hospital, you give a sample, you often sign a permission form now that actually, you know, allows them to sequence your genome. Mm -hmm. Why aren't all those the things that are making up the pan genome? Why is it that those sequences are not uh, part of this project in a sense? Well, they might be once we get longer and longer reads and this T to T genome becomes routine. But right now, typically when people go into a clinic, they're getting this type of short read data sets. And a lot of these big differences, not the little ones, are really hard to map and track. And prior studies have suggested we're missing about 70% of them with our standard ways of analyzing variation. So we're just not even, you're getting your information, but you're just not getting a comprehensive view of your genome yet. I. I hate to look into a crystal ball, knowing there's so many sequencing technology experts on the call, and they're like, oh, Karen. <laughs> but I do anticipate that this will be an exciting five years. I've just been seeing so much growth to where maybe in the future when you do go, that type of genome that you get out, once again, might be the same quality as the references we're using today. However, I want to emphasize that reference resource that we're building is pretty special because it's not just going to be a collection of sequences is going to have a lot more information than that. Okay. So then what is it about the, lo how does it that we get to the long read sequences? What is the sort of technical, mm -hmm. the technical breakthrough that allows that? Is it a device or is it something else? Well, we have stood on the shoulders of giants here, and this is really crediting the Pacific uh, PacBio um, uh, sequencing technology where you're able to, in real time, take movies as the polymerase is going around and around, and you get these amazing, accurate uh, reads, these high-fidelity reads that have just been incredibly useful to our team. Also, we've made um, use of the nanopore device, as I presented, that has its history embedded at UC Santa Cruz, where we can now read not 100 ATCGs, but a million ATCGs. And at the beginning, um, this may not be super accurate, the same way as the HiFi platform, but what we're seeing is leaps and bounds and the improvement of that prediction of, yes, that's an A, I'm highly confident in it, is going up. And so there's lots of reasons to be optimistic to your question that these two existing technologies have just been so dramatic in their improvements over a short amount of time that there's real promise in it, what existing tools are there. However, acknowledging that you are the dean of an engineering school, there are always openings for new technology, new exciting spaces for long reads. And it, you can imagine instantly that if you had a uh, microfluidic channel, right, where you could now begin to stretch out 10 million bases and have that same high accurate read, it takes away a lot of the pomp and circumstance of my talk of putting these things together because it becomes quite easy if you have a puzzle of two pieces, <laughs> you know, and I'm being a little sarcastic, but at the same time, I think there are absolutely room for technology, uh, new engineering, new technology, and, and I think that having classes that introduce students to this technology and, and encourage them to think creatively will be this wonderful opportunity to see where we are in the next five years. Uh, this line of questioning, thank you, first of all, but this line of questioning makes me think uh, or ask the question, when you talk about a somatic um, mm -hmm. 
genome, where? Where, you know, what part of the body is the sample coming from? Mm -hmm. And has anybody done a comparison between, say, germ cell genomes and somatic genomes from various places to really understand? We have a, you're building a reference set, mm -hmm. but um, is, is, is blood DNA going to be the same as some other source? And how accurate is a, is a genome in the end if you don't have a germ cell genome? That is a wonderful question. As you can imagine, we um, are limited in, in the type of resources we can use for a project like this. Blood is way more accessible, and that when you start dealing with things like lymphoblastoid, you are thinking about rearrangements in certain parts of the genome that are involved with immune response. And, and, and so I do feel like we are um, seeing things that perhaps we wouldn't see if we were in a germ cell or another type of cell. There are individuals and researchers around the world who are actively looking at this type of somatic tissue specific um, of sequence variants that's crediting once again these types of big consortiums that are popping up to try to to do this in earnest. The first T to T consortium um, release was actually not from blood. It was a very strange cell. <laughs> it might get the closest we can toward a, a germ cell. So um, we all inherit two genomes. You get one from your mother and one from your father. I kind of glazed over this, but we're diploid is the word that we use. And, and that is really difficult, as you can imagine. It's almost like you have two puzzles that look identical to one another except for small differences, and you just threw them in the same box. And so the first thing you have to do is kind of pull out these two separate puzzles and then put them together. And that was really difficult at the beginning. It's something we can do and we reproducibly do now, but at the beginning we could not do that. And so we had to fall back on a very specialized cell line. It was derived from a complete hydatidiform mole. And what this is, is early in development, you have an egg. And either before you have fertilization or after, the whole maternal genome is lost. So what we were studying was just the paternal genome duplicated. And so that gets us as close as possible to this type of germline question. And I was, as a person who studies repeat biologies with um, a lot of enthusiasm, more than I care to admit to my parents. Um, I think that that was a point where I was like, oh, this is going to be completely nutty. I'm in this really weird cell line. Things are going to be crazy. I'm so used to looking at blood. I'm so used to looking at this type of fibroblast cell. And it was amazing how stable some of these repeats were in this early development. But when we look at these epigenetic patterns, the DNA modification, that's where we started seeing some really interesting things. And I would love, personally, as a, as a researcher, to go more into early development, because I feel like some of the, the really cool results that we started seeing, we can't repeat that in these terminally differentiated blood cells. And so I do think that there's not, and uh, forgive me for meandering a bit, but I do feel like your, your, your question is being answered at the genetic level. People really care about this. We're trying to increase our, our repositories of somatic variation. But I also want to emphasize that your point's really valuable because there's really a lot of epigenetic stories there too that we couldn't see before and, and having a complete map will bring that to light. It's a follow on to Alex's question, mm -hmm. but is the the primary technological challenge to scale the repeatability or consistency, or are there other technological challenges that you highlighted? Oh, if you ask me, the biggest technological challenge is the one that Alex mentioned about global partnerships and ensuring <laughs> benefit and outreach. To me, that keeps me up most nights. But I think that the technological challenge is always changing. Right now, as you correctly mentioned, it's not useful for us to have one stellar genome and the rest of them are just okay. In order to make this reference resource work, we have to do this at a scale of production that's never been seen before. No one has ever done production of genomes. In fact, we have, we're constantly changing. We're about to change our own formula internally at UC Santa Cruz and start production again because we work with the leaders in assembly. We work with the leaders who are developing these new methods to put these genomes together. And then we have to go through and demonstrate we can scale it and reproducibly get that type of, of genome. And I'm gonna say, as the director of the Reference Production Center, that's still not enough to your next technological question. Having all these genomes is, is great, but you have to have a whole reboot of how we've been operating. This can't be a linear string of characters anymore. And this idea that we're moving into a pan-genome 
is something that I think doesn't strike a lot of people. It sounds really jargony and specialist, but at the same time, it, it creates a new world of where we need to develop new tools, make this streamlined, ensure that clinicians can make instant, you know, kind of benefit from utilizing this. And that's something that doesn't exist yet. And we have a lot of tools and a lot of early development, which I think is extremely promising. But I think our important next task is just not only building these phenomenal re resources and references, which we're showing that we can do, but to build this resource that's actually useful to people, to where everyone says, yeah, I know about the pen genome. You know, my doctor uses it. If someone said that to me, we've won, you know? And until we get there, it's, it's a big, big divide, to be quite honest, in, in trying to get there in terms of tool development. Okay, we have we have time for for one more question, and so I will ask it. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, you you mentioned um, yeah you mentioned the clinic, mm -hmm. and um, it clearly one of the things that is is held with great um, sensitivity is 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 putting into practice um, experimental techniques and. And drugs and, mm -hmm. and other things, and you know, there's a very there had been a very rigorous process mm -hmm. until the pandemic, um, which kind of uh, disrupted that that process. How do you see uh, this work and the use of of knowledge of the genome working its way into actual practice? And are there barriers to that, or have, have we gotten beyond that in some sense? We have not gotten beyond this. This is a big huge barrier. I think a lot of clinicians are still using what we call in the field HG19, which is the human reference that's even before the <laughs> reference the TDT replaced. And that's because, um, understandably, we all care deeply about safety. We all care about regiment protocols and approval. And I think that um, there are some real sincere steps and considerations that a, a clinical genetics company or new therapeutics need to make before jumping onto this new pan genome. It needs to be shown that it's stable. The tools need to be proven that they're reproducible. The benefit has to be shown clearly. Um, and I think that that's our goal. We need to create that type of infrastructure to where the benefit is clear, and then hopefully it'll find its way. Yeah, that's great. Thank mm -hmm. you. I, I'm sorry. I have to ask one more question. <laughs> I have to. What was it like to be on the stage with Bill Clinton and Bono? <laughs> It was a little unnerving at the beginning, I'll be honest. <laughs> but they were lovely. Um, I felt like it was um, clear being on stage that the Human Genome Project was the pride of, of Bill Clinton's administration. And seeing this uh, attention and funding structure moving to ensuring global equity for genetics in the future, I think, was inspiring to me as well when I left the stage. So, yeah. But, Overall, I was a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. George? Thank you very much, Alex and Karen, for that fascinating lecture. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, please watch your email for future lectures, and good night.